Now let us hear words from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Christians in Rome from the 12th chapter. We read these words. So brothers and sisters, because of God's mercy, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is what is good and pleasing and mature. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, my dear friends, I stand before you as one who feels a little intimidated by the task before me to speak to you about wisdom. For who among us is wise? I remember thinking when I received the phone call that I was going to be appointed to Washington Street United Methodist Church, saying, oh my goodness, that congregation is filled with very smart and wise people. Am I wise enough and smart enough to be pastor of that great congregation. Self-doubts start to slip in. For wise decision-making is so important in life. The value of making wise decisions is why many corporations pay large dollar amounts to their CEOs and their leaders. Because they know that unwise decisions can be very, very costly. But sometimes I feel like King Arthur. Do many of y'all remember the play and the story about Camelot? King Arthur had his magician friend Merlin always at his side. And whenever there was a decision that needed to be made, Arthur would consult Merlin. Merlin kept trying to get King Arthur to think on his own and to make decisions, but he resisted. There comes a point in the story where the knights of the round table, who were once comrades and unified, are warring with one another. There is a war about to take place. A rebellion is bubbling up. And Arthur has just found out that the love of his, wa- of his life is having an affair with Lancelot. All seems lost. And Arthur wants Merlin to tell him what to do, how to deal with all this stuff that is going on around him. But Merlin is no longer there. Merlin is dead. And King Arthur is tested, tested for his wisdom. How can he move forward and lead the kingdom Without Merlin's advice, his answer man is no longer there to whisper in his ear what to do. And so in desperation, King Arthur cries out, Oh Merlin, where are you now when I need you the most? Making decisions and having to think is such a blight. And it can be, can't it? It's so much easier to lean on someone else to tell us what to do in life. And maybe that's why Google and Siri and Alexis are so popular for us today. Because we want someone else to answer our questions for us. We know that making the right decision 
is so important in life, particularly in some of the issues that we are dealing with in the world today. Yesterday, many of us took moments to remember what took place 20 years ago on September the 11th. We remembered that terrorists hijacked four American jets with passengers on board and crashed them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. We remember that terrorists also intended to crash a plane into the U.S. Capitol. But passengers on board that flight defied the hijackers, and the plane crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. That morning, as reports of the attacks came into the Federal Aviation Commissioner's offices, the National Operations Manager, Ben Sleeney, made a critical decision. The decision was to ground all U.S. flights that day and to close down American airspace for all but life-saving purposes. That was a once-in-a-lifetime kind of decision that he was called on to make. And I'm sure he faced questions about his decisions. Was he making the right decision at that time. Every impactful decision that we make encounters opposition. People who question our wisdom. But looking back from our vantage point now, just about everyone will agree that he made a wise decision. But it wasn't an easy call for him that morning. He only had a small window of time in which to make that decision to determine were there other terrorists on other planes? Were there other crashes about to take place? What did he need to do? He had to consider his options quickly. His decision-making skill was even more impressive, though, when you hear that this was his very first day on the job. That's right. It was his very first day on the job. Making decisions, wise decisions, takes strength and it takes courage and it takes being grounded in something that gives us the confidence to do that. Making wise decisions does not come naturally to any of us, my friends. And that's why in the book of Proverbs, we are given so many admonitions to seek wisdom. Did you hear how in the short passage that I read today from Proverbs 4, we are told multiple times to seek wisdom, to seek it diligently. And yet, as Beth so wisely said in her children's message, so few of us begin our days seeking wisdom. Instead, we seek information instead of wisdom. And as we learned last week, wisdom is different from knowledge and information. Wisdom is about knowing how to use the information and knowledge that we have. Wisdom is putting it into practice. But I think one of the reasons that we don't make wise choices with all the information that we have today is because there's such a glut of information to decipher. I read an interesting article just recently. It was an article about casinos. 
Now, I know none of the good Methodists gamble and go to casinos, right? But I'm told that inside of a casino, there are rarely any windows or clocks because casino owners don't want people to be distracted and notice how much time they're spending at the gambling tables. They want them to turn their minds off and just focus in on gambling. This information came from a book titled Addiction by Design, Machine Gambling in Las Vegas. And the writer points out that even hallways in most casinos are designed to curve around the interior of the casino. Why are they designed to curve around? He says, because 90-degree angles activate decision-making choices in our brains. And casinos don't want their patrons to activate that portion of their brain that kicks in their decision-making ability, their ability to make wise choices while in the casino. Because then they might stop. They might question why they're wasting their money and their time gambling. Many casinos are actually designed without any 90 degree angles at all, he says. We are flooded in our world today, living in a world like a casino, a casino that wants to entertain us and distract us from stopping long enough to think about what we are doing with our time, our energy, and our resources. We live in a time of information overload when we have multiple options for everything in life and we don't have enough time to stop and think. We don't realize how much time we're wasting as we scroll through our Instagram account, our Facebook account, check our Twitter feed. We don't realize how the time is just passing us by and what we could do with that time and energy instead. And when we are confronted with the decisions that we need to make, we run to Google and Siri and Alexa, and we say, tell us what to do. Magical Merlins in our hands, in our pockets. In theory, our computers and our smartphones are vast repositories of information at our disposal to help us make wise decisions. And they can be a wonderful thing, but they can also be so paralyzing because the more we look at the options, the more we get confused about what direction to go in. And so I believe we need models to help us navigate through all that is coming at us so that we can use the information wisely and discern what information to truly take in and hold on to and what information to let go of. Some of you might quote the Bob Dylan lyric, I don't need a weatherman to tell me which way the wind is blowing. I don't need to consult my technology. I'll just go with what I think. And that may be true for some things. We don't need an app to tell us how much we slept last night to determine whether or not we feel rested in the morning. We know whether or not we feel rested. The app can give us good information for our doctors to help determine why we don't feel rested. But we can know certain things on our own. But there are other larger questions in life in this post 9-11 world that we live in where we are more divided now than we ever have been, where we are confronted with questions that are not easily answered. How do we reconcile 
our questions about why God would allow evil things to happen? What are our pathways to understanding the root causes of terror and racism and abuse? What is the journey that leads us to understanding how we can live at peace with one another when we don't all agree on the same things? In this global community where every action immediately produces a reaction, what is the gospel that speaks of forgiveness and kindness to strangers and love of enemy and compassion calling us to do as disciples of Jesus Christ to end racism, to end persecution for our LGBTQI persons that we love and know? How are we to follow Christ in the world today? The text that we read today from Paul's letter to the church in Rome gives us a place to start. United Methodist pastor and teacher Adam Hamilton says that this 12th chapter of Romans is one of the greatest chapters in all of Scripture. Because after devoting 11 chapters to describing the human condition and God's mercy through Jesus, and God's work for us by the Spirit, Paul now turns in this 12th chapter to the implications of how we are to live our lives as followers of Christ. Some of the most clear and powerful verses of Christian life are found in these chapters. That follow. And so he begins by telling us that we are to renew our minds. Renew our minds. What does that mean? Well, it helps me to remember who Paul is and how Paul renewed his mind. If you remember, Paul was a Pharisee, one of those followers of the law, very, real, very well educated, knowledgeable about the laws. He was very sure and confident of himself that he knew the right thing to do all the time in the right ways. And he took it as his mission to make sure that other people knew what he understood to be the right way, and that they needed to follow in that same right way. But then you recall, as he's going to Damascus, he has a supernatural encounter with the living Christ. He hears the voice of Jesus speaking to him, and it radically changes the direction of his life. Now, what we don't often remember is that Paul didn't immediately start to plant churches and to talk about following Christ right after that encounter with Jesus' voice. There's a gap of 17 years before he actually starts his ministry. And what did he do during those 17 years? He re-evaluated and examined what he had been taught and what he had learned. He looked at what he believed about who God is and what God has called him to do with his life. My friends, spending quiet moments of discernment, reflecting on what we truly believe is important. I dare say every one of you in here today would agree with me when I say what we believe is important. Because what we believe about God and God's character shapes and determines how we live life, doesn't it? 
what we believe about the ultimate values in life shapes and determines the choices that we make. Renewing our minds begins with taking the time to truly discern what we believe and where that belief comes from. You know, it's interesting. I have found that many atheists and skeptics come from a strong Christian background. Did you know that? Many of them don't just come from strong Christian backgrounds. They come from fundamentalist, strict backgrounds where clear rules of right and wrong and what you should think and not think have been impressed upon them. So, so strongly that they are told, if you don't believe these things exactly this way, then you aren't really a Christian. Don't ever question these things. Don't ever doubt these things. Just accept them and believe them. But my friends, as another United Methodist pastor quoted to me just recently, a faith that cannot take questions is not strong enough to sustain us. A faith that cannot take questions is not strong enough to sustain us. Now, the United Methodist Church has been criticized by many as a denomination where you can believe anything you want to believe. Open doors, open hearts, open minds has been criticized as an open box to just do what you want, think what you want. It really doesn't matter. Now, there's an appeal to open hearts, open minds, open doors. But it does matter what we believe, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. If someone came in here and stood at this pulpit and started saying to you things like, there are certain ones, ones of us that God has ordained to be superior to others of us. If they started spouting off a racist ideology like that, we wouldn't stand for it, would we? We'd say, no, that is wrong. There are certain beliefs that are foundational to who we are. And one of those foundational beliefs is that we are all God's children. We are all equal at the foot of the cross. If someone came in here and said that they believe the purpose of life is just to find happiness, and therefore the church is meant to entertain me, and to make me feel comfortable and to meet my needs, we'd have to say, well, wait a minute. Look at the cross. The cross reminds us that we follow one who suffered and died out of love for each one of us. And that has implications for the way that we live. It's not just all about me being happy and gratified. Sometimes I might have to suffer for the needs of others. What we believe matters. For our beliefs, and our beliefs inform our words and our actions. Our beliefs help us to discern the wise choices in life. In order to get down to the core of what we believe, I encourage us to do like Paul, to take some time to discern what we truly believe about who God is. What is God's character? What has God called us to do? What does God's word say about our brothers and sisters and about people who agree and disagree with us? What do the Holy Scriptures tell us about how we are to live with one another? You see, we're all built with a desire to believe in something. 
Every one of us believes in something, whether we can articulate it or not. And we run into problems when we don't know how to articulate what we believe. We need to spend time learning how to listen for God's words of wisdom informing our minds. John Wesley encouraged us at the beginning of every year to pray a prayer reminding us of who we are and who God has called us to be. The prayer describes the life of a participant in Christ's mission in the church. It's a practical description of what Jesus calls us to do when Jesus says, if any of you want to be my followers, let them take up their cross and follow me. His prayer was adapted from the Puritan tradition that was so important to his parents, Samuel and Susanna, and his life at Epworth. It informed his theology, it informed his preaching, and he expected us as people called Methodist to take this prayer as our own, to examine our lives as we pray this prayer. For when we pray this prayer, we remember that we are named and claimed in the waters of baptism as God's children, precious in God's sight and called to live in the paths of righteousness. I want you to hear the words of this prayer. I am no longer my own, but thine, O God. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering, let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. My friends, there are many great issues in our world today that Google and Alexa and Siri cannot answer for us. They call us to have a discerning mind. And a discerning mind begins with knowing who we are in God's eyes, knowing what God has called us and created us to be, being humble enough to sit at the foot of the cross, to begin our days seeking wisdom beyond ourselves. Some of you received an e-blast this week inviting you to join me on a wisdom challenge, a challenge to take steps to actually do this in our lives, to look at the different areas of life where we receive information and to take some time to discern what we will do with that information, to make wise choices about the information that we have received. Attached to that e-blast were practical steps in different areas, and I'm inviting you to start tomorrow with me to choose to do several of these over the next 30 days and to see how we together might grow in wisdom and grace. If you didn't receive the e-blast and you'd like to, simply fill out one of those connection cards with your email address and, and write on there, send me the 30-day challenge. I've also printed some copies that I'll take out to the Narthex with me at the end of the service today if you want to pick up one of those. But practical ways that we can start making wiser choices about the information that we receive and what we do with it.
Proverbs tells us to seek wisdom and she will guard your days. May it be so for you and for me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.